Well, some sermons are easy. Some sermons will stretch you a little bit more. And this is one that has been on my heart and one that comes out of the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to be talking about what's called sacred sexuality. And some of you are like, what, what's sacred sexuality? What do you mean by that? Uh, and, and really what I mean by that is that it's, it's sexuality expressed as God has designed it. Sometimes we, we look at our sexuality and we think it's sort of something that embarrasses God or something that maybe God isn't interested in. But when we grapple with God's word, we discover that God's the inventor of sexuality. God made male and female. As a matter of fact, God not only made male and female, God feels pretty good about it. Uh, we're going to see that in the biblical text. But, but there's, there's a sacredness when we express ourselves as men and women and in the boundaries that God has given as sexual people in a way that actually brings glory to the God of heaven. God doesn't kind of block his eyes when a married couple goes in the bedroom. God doesn't get embarrassed by that. God delights in what he's designed. And so I want to think about that to just first understand that God invented sexuality and has a good plan for us as men and women. God is the inventor. God is the creator of sexuality. God could have made the heavens and the earth and everything in them any way he wanted, and he made men and women. And so I want to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And so if you have a Bible, you can open it to the very, first, very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. Chapter 1 happens to be the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Uh, if you're a math uh, expert, you'll recognize that, uh, chapter 1. And so in Genesis chapter 1, this picture begins to unfold of God's creation. It's interesting, in Genesis 1 and 2, God tells the story twice, one with more detail in chapter 2 as he kind of unfolds, and we'll look at both of these texts. But look with me at Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. That's God in, in, in his triune, eternal being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, saying, let us make man in our image. And then in verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. And then you go down to verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. In the very, in the very fabric of creation, as God is speaking and creating the heavens and the earth, he makes people. And I want to make some observations about God's creative process and what God is doing in making men and women. First is this. The beauty and dignity of all people made in God's image. The Latin term that the theologians have used throughout history is the imago Dei. It's a beautiful term, the imago Dei, the image of God. And here's what that means. That means that you, in some way, probably beyond your full comprehension, you are made in the image of the living God. Wow. That's, I'm gonna make men and women in my image. It also means that every person you encounter has been made in the image of God. No, no matter their struggles, no matter brokenness, no matter what it is, you can look at another person and say, this is a person made in the imago Dei, the image of God. And sometimes that image is broken, sometimes that image is, is, is kind of, you know, we don't follow the way we should, but we are made in the image of God. That's a beautiful thing. I also want you to notice, notice something else. Sexuality, being male and female, and sexuality, sexual intimacy, within the covenant relationship that God established, are all in place in the first chapter of Genesis. And sin doesn't come, the fall doesn't come till chapter three. All right, that's where sin and the fall come in. So in absolute perfect paradise, made by God Almighty, God makes masculinity, femininity, and God says, be fruitful and multiply. Have babies, have a family. And that's before sin, before the fall. Don't look at sexuality as something that's a result of the, sin, of, of the fall. Sexuality is not sinful. Abusive sexuality is sinful. But God's design and God's plan is good. And, and we have to embrace that. We have to understand that. Also notice, and it's very clear, that male and female are both valuable. And though we're different, we complement each other in a way that, that fulfills the vision of the presence of God. The imago Dei, the image of God, is seen in man and woman together. I don't know exactly how all that works. I, I just know that what God is saying is to fully show his image to the world, it's a man and a woman together. There's a sense of, of, of this, this partnership and it reveals the presence of God. Also, 
You see man and woman bearing children. You see family, be fruitful and multiply. That's Bible talk for make babies, all right? And, and so that's there again, that, that, that's implied, be sexually intimate. God speaks that to Adam and Eve. And so that's part of God's plan. And it doesn't mean that every married couple will have children, but it does mean that part of God's plan is that there are men and women together that, that, that have children that start families that honor him. And then it's very interesting to realize that as we get to this part of Genesis chapter one, and where God says it is very good, up to this point, as God's been creating, he makes the heavens and the earth, and God says, good. And, and then he, he, make, he makes you know, the sun and the stars, and God says, good. And he makes animals, and God says, good. And the fish of the sea, God says, good. But it's when he makes a man and a woman and brings them together that God says, this is very good. It's the first time God puts it that way. And, and so there's this sense of just celebrating what God has done. And then in Genesis chapter two, if you have your Bibles, or if you have your Bible app, you can open to Genesis chapter two. God sort of circles back and tells the story again, but with more detail from a, from a unique perspective. So in Genesis two, verse 18, we read this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So now Adam is created and then God's gonna make a, a, a suitable partner for him. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And notice the order here. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. There's this beautiful picture of this garden, of this paradise, of Adam and Eve, and God's joined them together, and there's no shame. So a couple things out of this passage. First of all, aloneness is not good. God has designed us for community. One of the seven markers of spiritual maturity that we talk about at Shoreline here is, is consistent community. We need to be in community with other people, and here God says of Adam, it's not good that he's alone. I need to bring him into community. And so God wants us to walk in community. Also, when, when the passage says, I will make a helper for him, there's people that go, whoa, 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 time out. The woman's the helper, the little helper, is that where, that's not the point at all. Do you know that, that name helper? You, you know who else that name is used for in the Bible? The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of the living God, the same word from the Hebrew to the Greek, the same word there is helper, partner. One who inspires. Who got, you know, so they're, they're, it's a place of dignity and strength. It's not a place of belittlement. All right, so, so understand that, that, that God says, I'm gonna bring these two together, do something that wouldn't happen with either of them separate from each other. And I want you to notice the process that we see here. There, there's four parts to this process, and, we, and the, the order matters. So he says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother, a man or a woman, there's a point where we leave our family of origin. That, that's part of the thing. It doesn't mean we have nothing to do with them, but there's a beginning of a new thing. So there's a sense that you leave your father and mother, then they're united. This is the covenantal union of spirit between these two people. This, this is what a marriage covenant before God does. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But, but, they, but they become united. They become one spiritually. So leave father and mother, become one spiritually. That's, that's the covenant relationship that God establishes through marriage. Then they become one flesh. That's the sexual intimacy. There's an order, there's a progress here. And then when it follows that progress, it says they felt no shame. Because there's no shame in living in God's will and God's ways. And so, so as they follow this, there's, there's a sense of nakedness and no shame. And so this is, this is a simple statement that has been part of what the church has believed and said for, for centuries, but every century there's different people who will push back against this. And so just listen to this simple statement. So here's the design, God's design, design for our sexual expression. God's design is one man and one woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime. That's God's design. That's God's plan. Do we always follow God's plan? No. Does God force us to follow his ways? No. But when you read the scriptures, when you look at the Bible, this is God's design. This is God's plan. One man and one woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime, and within that covenant relationship, sexual expression, there is no shame, it is good, it is beautiful. God says it is very good. Now, 
in our world today as has always been the case in the world. There are ways that people will live outside these guidelines. Don't think that people living outside the guidelines of one man and one woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime, don't think this is a new thing. If you went to first century Rome, you would find every kind of expression of sexuality that you can imagine. And so if right now if you're thinking, okay, well, wait a minute. So you're saying God's design is one man, one woman, covenant of marriage for a lifetime. And, and every one of us has people, cl- people we love close to us in our family, friends, our circle of relationships, people that we love and care about who aren't living within those boundaries in some way or another. You say, well, there's probably dozens of ways people can live outside those boundaries. There's actually hundreds of ways people can live outside those boundaries. And we're not going to walk through all the different ways people can walk outside the boundaries. We're going to focus on what it means and looks like to walk within those boundaries and understand what God has made and what God has established. And so I'm not here to single out different ways of not living within those boundaries, but to lift up the goodness and the glory and the beauty of what God's designed. And for some of you, you may be thinking, okay, wait a minute, though. What you're talking about Are you saying that that this person I love or I care about in my family, my friend, or me, myself, I'm not living within those boundaries? Are you saying that that's not God's perfect design for flourishing and for life and for goodness and for beauty? And I'm saying, yes, that's not God's design. Whatever it is that's in your mind. Well, what about this person, that person? If it's not within those boundaries, it's not within the guidelines that God has established. And I believe as, as Christians, we have to have these conversations. As a pastor, we have to talk about these things. This is in God's word, and God's word's been clear throughout all history. It's still clear today. And so here's what we see in the scriptures. That God sets boundaries for the children he loves, including sexual boundaries. I mean, God sets boundaries, and God God says don't lie, but speak the truth. You know, God God says don't dishonor the Sabbath, get rest. God sets boundaries of all sorts, and some of the boundaries we kind of like, some of the boundaries we don't like. But God sets boundaries because he loves us, including sexual boundaries. So in Exodus chapter 20... Verse 14, this is what God says. You shall not commit adultery. God says you shall not commit adultery. What's he saying? He's saying that when a man and a woman come together in the covenant of marriage and they become one spiritually, that their sexual expression is now reserved for, that, for their spouse, for that person they've committed to be with for a lifetime. He says don't commit adultery. Don't, don't go find sexual pleasure outside of that marriage relationship. That's, that's breaking that covenant. And that's what, that, that's what the word of God is talking about. You shall not commit adultery. There are boundaries established. Why? For our good. Even if we don't understand that they're for our good. And all through the Bible, there's amazing passages that talk about the goodness of sexuality, the beauty of it, but the boundaries. And if you want to really dig into a study on one of these, read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. Those three chapters all talk about uh, sexual purity, boundaries, being aware of temptations, and as, as, as Proverbs is talking about temptation, it's talking about this picture of a person who's enticing someone. They're not married to them. This, this person is married. In this case, it's a man who's married to his wife. And there's a woman outside the marriage who's enticing him and seducing him and inviting him into a, an inappropriate relationship, breaking God's boundaries. So in Proverbs 7, 24, we read this. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray to her paths. This person who's enticing. That could also say... Now, listen then, my daughters, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to his ways or stray to his paths. If you're married in that covenant relationship, don't be enticed by a person outside your marriage relationship. And then it says, many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Saying, man, it's costly. If if you've married this person, you have this man and woman, and they say we love each other, hopefully they say we love Jesus, and they're in this covenant relationship together, and then you begin to look outside and be enticed outside. It says, there's a cost. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. And we all know that's true. It costs every person in the family. It costs, and even even if it says, well, what if I don't get caught? There's a cost to our own soul. And and so this, this applies to men, this applies to women. There's a cost when you're in that covenant relationship and you break that covenant. And, and so for those that are thinking about that, that are enticed with that, for those that are living in that, say, I, I, I need to turn from that. I need to align my life again with the will of God. And why would we align our lives with the will of God? Because God's boundaries lead to freedom, even when we don't understand how. Do you hear that? God's boundaries actually set us free, even if we can't compute why or how. God says, I've got boundaries. I know what's best for you. Your life will flourish. You will find greater joy living within my boundaries than living outside of them, even if you don't get it. So Sherry and I were engaged for about a year. And the first, the first year we were, we were uh, dating 
We were 2,000 miles apart. I was in Wheaton, Illinois. She was in uh, up there, uh, Pomona, California, Chino, California. So we were 2,000 miles apart. So we didn't really struggle with crossing boundaries with sexuality too much because we were 2,000 miles apart. Everybody following that? Okay. And so, but then, uh, then I moved back to California and we're in, we got engaged. And so here we are engaged. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think as a young man engaged to my lovely wife-to-be, do you think I was attracted to her? Someone said, oh yeah, and that's exactly the answer. Oh yeah, was that, was that you there? Anyway, somebody, somebody gave it, oh yeah. Uh, very attractive. And so, so now we have a year that we're engaged. But we believe what the Bible teaches, what the church has believed throughout history and still believes today, that, that sexual intimacy and expression is to be between a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime. But do you think over that year that I ever rationalized in my mind, wait, you know, well, yeah, but we're, you know, we're, we love each other. We're committed for the rest of our lives. We know we're going to be married. It's, it's, it's only, the wedding's only six months away. I mean, what's a wedding ceremony mean anyways? What's a piece of paper, right? I mean, do you think that went through my mind? Amen. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you, oh yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> feel, feel free to jump in. So, and so, and, and so like three weeks before our wedding day, you know, I, th- I think I probably went through a hundred different justifications for why we should be able to be sexually intimate before we're married, in my mind. But none of them changed the fact that God says, a man and a woman, covenant of marriage, we weren't married yet, for a lifetime. I, like I, came, I probably came up with a thousand rationalizations. Sherry probably came up with a thousand, uh, two thousand, ten thousand, probably, I don't know. Um, <laughs> And uh, you're smiling, right? Because she's smiling. Um, but but I, I can't tell you how many times one of us or the other would just say, we have, to, we have to leave each other now. We can't be together right now. Because, because we wanted to live in the guidelines that God gave. But I didn't understand God's guidelines. In a sense, I didn't like, oh, it makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't want to sleep with her. I, don't, that, I have no interest in that. It's like, no, everything in me wanted what I shouldn't have had, but I said, but God's boundaries are this. And, and you know, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of times that we said no to each other in that year of engagement, and it was hundreds of times, that we said no to each other, prepared us for once we were married. Because here's what happens when a, when a couple who's engaged or going to get married and they say, we're just going to, we, you know, we're going to justify breaking God's boundaries. We're not, we're not married, but we're going to be sexually intimate and we're going to live that way. Every time we do that, we're preparing ourselves for unfaithfulness later. Why? Because we're practicing saying no to God and yes to what I want. And then you get married and you made a covenant to this person, but someone outside the marriage entices us. And we're used to saying no to what God's boundaries are and yes to what we want. And we say, oh, well, why not that? I practiced for unfaithfulness. We got to practice for faithfulness by saying, no, 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 no. I love you. Go away. That was part of it. But, and, and so now, l- later I can look back and say, I, I get why God designed it that way, but at the time, it didn't make sense to me. We just had to try to be faithful because God says, this is the best way to live. It's the way that sets you free. It's the wisest way to live. Now, when people stumble and don't follow that, is God's grace enough? Absolutely. But do we just do whatever we want because God's going to forgive us? No. See, when we forgive, does God extend grace? What's the answer? Yes, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you confess Jesus, when we, free, when, we, when, when we sin and break God's ways, God extends grace. But in Romans chapter six, the apostle Paul says, should we, because when we sin, God extends grace, should we continue to sin because we get grace? Do you sin that grace may abound? And the apostle Paul says, no, there's four ways to say no in the Greek language. The strongest of them is me genoita. God forbid, may it never be so. That's what, should we just sin because we know God will forgive us? He says, may genoita. May it never be so. But when we sin, God's grace abounds. But we shouldn't sin because God's grace does abound. That's the challenge that we have. And, and that's why we talk about grace on a day like this because all of us at different times in some area of our lives, we live outside of God's will and we go to him for the grace we need. But we don't say, I can keep doing that because God's gracious. Now, I want to look at a passage from Jeremiah 29. If you have your Bibles, turn there. And there's a passage here that's one of the most quoted passages in all the Bible. It's one of the most memorized, and for some people it's their favorite passage in the Bible, but it's absolutely abused. It's taken out of its context. So it seems really happy clappy, but it's actually a really challenging passage. So I want to read the whole passage and talk about this. Because because there's times where we want what we want, but God's plans are bigger than what we understand. So Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 10. This is what the sovereign Lord says. 
when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. The people have been in captivity for 70 years because they had turned their heart, their back on God. They were living out of God's will and they had been persecuted and they were now exiles in a foreign land. It was a difficult time. And then verse 11 pops up. This is the one that we like to go clip, clip and take just this one verse out. But I want you to get the whole context. Okay, here's verse 11. For, for I know the plans I have, <laughs> excuse me, have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. And not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't that a great verse? I love that verse. But it's right here in a context. What's happening? Look at verse 12. Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. They're turning their hearts back to God. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. These 70 years in the captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Does God say to you and me, I have great plans for you to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope, plans to give you a future? Yes. But those plans align with his will, not doing whatever we want. And this verse is given to a people who for 70 years have been in captivity because they all turned their backs on God and didn't follow his ways. And then they basically ended up living their own way and it took them into prison and a lack of freedom and brokenness. And God says, I will bring you back to myself. And so we don't always understand God's ways, but the trick is, and, and here, here's, when it, when it comes to this book, when it comes to the Bible, there's two ways to come to the Bible. There's two ways. Here's one way. I'm going to live the way I want to live and do what I want to do and do what makes me happy, and I will try to make the Bible agree with me. And I'll pick the parts I like, and I'll leave out the parts I don't like, and I'll change the parts that don't fit. But I'm going to decide what I want to do, and I want to make the Bible agree with me. Or... I'm going to come to the Bible and say, God, what do you say? You are wiser than me. You know the path to freedom and the path to life. And I will do all I can to shape my life to fit what you teach. Everybody following those two options? I know what I want. I'm going to make the Bible agree with me. I'm going to say, what does the Bible say? And I'm going to agree with it. The way we are called to live is by aligning our lives with the word of God. And that stretches us because there's times where we don't get it. We don't understand it. But we say, God, because I trust you, because you're wise, because you're God, I will follow the way that you lead even when it doesn't make sense to me. And that's the reality that we have to hold on to. Now, we also have to understand when you look, when you, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery, it's talking about a physical act of sexual unfaithfulness to, of a person who's married. But Jesus takes us to a deeper place. And here's where this will touch all of us. If that, maybe you're not struggling with temptation for adultery. Maybe you're not married yet. Maybe, you know, but, but for all of us, this can touch all of us. Okay? God's concern is greater than physical activity. Jesus says it's not just about what we do with our bodies, but it's about our minds, our eyes, and our hearts. So look with me at, at, at Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. First book of the New Testament. And we'll start in verse 27. And listen to what Jesus, and Jesus is giving commentary on the Ten Commandments, and on this commandment specifically. So in verse 27 of Matthew 5, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's what we've been talking about. So he's going back to the Ten Commandments. You have heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery. But now watch what Jesus does. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Any man who looks at a woman, lust, any woman who looks at a man lustfully has already committed adultery with him in her heart. Then Jesus gets really, now this is what's called a hyperbole. He's making a point by making it, using extreme language. But here's what he says. If your right eye causes you to sin, causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What's Jesus saying? He's not saying rip out your eye or cut off your hand. He's saying this challenge of of sexual purity, of sacred sexuality, is bigger than just what we do with our bodies. It's what we do with our eyes, what we look at, what we think about, and what happens in our hearts. And this touches all of us. Because we live in a culture and a time when explicit sexual imagery is available like it's never been in human history. And I've heard people say, you know, the world's worse than it's ever been. I don't think that's actually true. I think the world's always been, had lots of problems. But I can say this, the accessibility of sexually explicit imagery is more available than it's ever been in human. Click, 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 and you can be to about anything in the world you want to find. And you can be seven years old or 97 years old, it doesn't matter. 
And so we live in a time, I remember a day when parents were worried, where dads were worried that their boys might get a hold of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. It's like, oh, that, oh what, what's going to go through his mind if he sees girls in swimsuits, you know? Now, parents are paying for phones or online services that have, you know, show after show after show that has way more explicit nudity and sexual behavior following God's guidelines or outside of God's, God's guidelines than was ever on Sports Illustrated or in, you know, the Playboy magazine 40 years ago when I was a kid, I hear. Um, <laughs> You know, but, but um, a friend told me. But, you know, but our world has changed. Our world has changed. And now Christians in their teens or 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s can sit and binge watch shows that have explicit nudity, explicit sexual behavior, in many cases all kinds of behavior that's not in line with God's design and desire. And the more we see it, and, and I think this is why Jesus said, be careful what you look at and what guard your eyes. This is why he says, it's not just what you do, but it's, it's what you think. It, we have to guard our eyes because when you watch something over and over and over, it appears normal and normative. Oh, that's the way people are. That's the way life is. And, this, and, and parents who used to worry that their kids would see girls in swimsuits are now actually providing the services so that their kids can watch hour after hour after hour of stuff that presents sexuality in a way that is not at all in line with God's will. And so you have a generation growing up going, everything's normal, everything's fine, because they, they can be exposed to virtually everything that's out there. And so, and so Jesus is, is addressing this, and Jesus is saying, listen, it's so serious, you'd be better off to lose an eye or a hand than to let your heart and your mind go there. And so we've got to ask ourselves questions like, is the thing I'm, is what I'm viewing, is what I'm bringing into my eyes and impacting my mind and then my heart, is it honoring to Jesus? Does it portray the beauty of male and female? Or am I filling my heart and my mind with stuff that's causing me to look at things and become numb to things that should, I should say, that's not God's design, that's not God's plan. And, as, and we have to ask those questions. Or is, is the, are the things I'm watching portraying sexuality out of God's design? So that I myself as a Christian am beginning to more and more say, well, I guess that's normal because it's on this show and this show and this show and this show. And I, I think as Christians we have to be wise and we have to be careful. Because God, because God is a God who's deeply concerned about who we are. He wants the best for us in our bodies, in our eyes, in our minds, in our hearts. And we have to understand also that God is all about covenant. And so are those who follow him. God, our God is a God of covenant. Well, what is covenant? Covenant is an agreement between two parties sanctioned by God. Sometimes God's one of those parties. So through the Bible, God establishes covenants with Abraham, and he, he establishes covenants along the way uh, with different people, and, he, and he, he sets up these covenants to have this sense of agreement, a sacred agreement. And our God is about a, a sacred agreement. So marriage, mar when you have a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime, there's something about that that's that covenantal, that's sacred, that honors God. And so, so at Shoreline Church, we've had to grapple with this and, and how, kind of how the world functions. We've looked and said, okay, how, how do we handle marriage at Shoreline Church? Because what you have, what you've had for a long time is the state and the church have kind of been in the marriage business together. You know, it, it, you, know you get the paperwork from the state, but then the pastor signs the paperwork. And we looked at this and we said, really, are the pastors of Shoreline Church agents of the state or agents of God? Are, let me ask you, are the pastors of Shoreline Church agents of the state? What's the answer? No, we're agents of God. We serve God. So at Shoreline, if someone wants to get married, we, we want to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. The Bible says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It says, honor the governing authorities. So if somebody at Shoreline wants to get married, we say, that's great. Go to the state and get your paperwork and have the state sign the paperwork and you can be married in the eyes of the state. You can file your taxes together. You have your, you have your legal state marriage. If you want to be married in the eyes of God, come to the church. And our pastors will do a, celebra a wedding celebration of the Christian covenant of marriage. And so like when my son got married, he went to the city, he got the paperwork, he had all of them signed. No pastor at Shoreline has signed state papers for over three years now. We don't sign, we, we have a covenant of marriage that we've created before God and we sign that and they sign that and the state handles the state stuff and we handle the sacred stuff. That's, that's just how we function. So when my son was gonna get married, I didn't sign his wedding certificate, the state did. And representatives of the state did and, and people that were with him. And that, so and, so I, I did a marriage not long ago here in the, in the, in the courtyard and a couple you know, sent me a photograph picture of we got our state paperwork. Now we want to honor that, but now we're ready to get married in the sight of God. 
And, and anybody coming to the, start, the wedding celebration wouldn't have seen it as any different because they're not sitting there when we signed the paperwork. But when we signed paperwork, but it was a covenant of Christian marriage. That, that's how, that, those are the things we're grappling with. But we want to honor God, but also honor the governing authorities because the scriptures calls us to do that. And so there's something you need to understand about, kind of about, about our world, about sexuality. And, th- I'm gonna, and some of you, this will be surprising. Some of you, it won't be. But here's, here's what you need to understand. God's design for sexuality taught in the Bible, what we're talking about today, God's design for sexuality taught in the Bible has been the norm for Christians for all of history. It is still the norm for Christians in most of the world today and even in most churches in America. What we're talking about today, what I'm saying that this is the normal thing, a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime. That has been the normal Christian practice through all history. Globally right now, that is absolutely the norm. Some of the conversations happening in our culture aren't happening in lots of other countries of the world. For Christians, it's, there's no question, it's just what the Bible says. And even in America, Organic Outreach International, a ministry of this church, works with over 20,000 churches in America. And I would venture a guess that all of those churches would agree with exactly what we're talking about here. It's still the norm. You might start thinking by watching media and things, well, that every, you know, that's gone away. Nobody thinks that way anymore. Christians who hold to God's word are still holding to an understanding of sexuality that's a good gift from God, that's wonderful, but that God establishes the boundaries in a way that honor him and in a way that help us flourish and live the best lives possible. And, and this is a key thing when it comes to how we understand sexuality. Public acceptance does not change biblical teaching. Okay, public, public acceptance does not change biblical teaching. There's all kinds of things that a culture might say is fine that the Bible says isn't fine, and all kinds of topics. And we don't adjust what we believe based on what the culture accepts. We adjust what we believe as a church, like we do as individuals, what we believe based on the scriptures. So, within that, I want to share something else. That grace-filled and loving Christians can and will walk with people struggling with all kinds of sin, including sexual sin. And Jesus did. You need to hear this. That if, if you are a grace-filled, loving Christian, which is, that's really the only kind of Christian they're supposed to be, is grace-filled and loving. We will walk with people grappling with who are living outside of God's boundaries in every area of boundaries, including sexuality. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus got in the most trouble because he hung out with tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, people that weren't living within God's boundaries. But Jesus loved them, and listen to this, they loved Jesus. And so I can tell you as a pastor and as a person that we can love and care about people and walk with them even when we disagree on things. Even, even in, area, in areas of sexuality. And we can extend grace and love and care to people. There are, there are people in my extended family, the family I grew up in, my whole extended family, that when my family would be together, we had people involved in, you, any, you, if you name 20 ways that people can live outside of the biblical boundaries, probably 18 to 20 of those were happening in my family. And I love my family. And as a Christian, I didn't judge them or tear them down. But I didn't agree with how they were living, but I love them. As a pastor... I'm walking with people or have walked with people in this church who are not living within God's boundaries of sexuality and all all kinds of other areas as well. And I love them and I'm their pastor. And if you ask some of those people, you know, do you go to Pastor Kevin for prayer on things? They say, absolutely. Well, does he know that you're living this way, this way, this way, this way, outside of God's will and sexuality? They say, oh yeah. And they said, well, does does he love you? Does he care about you? They say, absolutely. And my church loves me too. Do they agree agree with how you're living? You know, they say, No. They don't, but they love me, and that's my church. That's my pastor. See, see can, can, can that be? I believe that's how it needs to be. And, and the problem is what we're being told today in our world is that, that you can't disagree with someone and still love them. Or we're told if you disagree with somebody, you actually hate them. So if you're a note taker, write this down. It is not unloving or hateful to disagree with people on the topic of sexuality. It is all about how we express our disagreement. It is not unloving, it is not hateful to disagree about how somebody's living. And, and, I, and I actually believe, and I'm, I'm going to use strong language, but I actually believe that the idea that if you disagree with someone, you hate them, is an absolute lie from the pit of hell. I believe it's an absolute deceptive lie from the enemy, and people are believing it. There are people in this church who, who, are, who are, well, if I said there are people in this church who aren't living perfectly in God's will, that would be all of us, first of all, Okay? That would be all of us. None of us are living perfectly in God's will. We're saved by God's grace. We need his grace. We're not living perfectly. But, but, but if, if I said to you, there are people in this church who are living outside of God's will and their sexuality. And, and if, you ask that, if you ask those people, um, 
do you know what your church believes? Most would say, absolutely. Does your church affirm the way you're living? They say, no, the church doesn't. Whatever, whatever it is, of any different variation of things that you might be running through your mind. But are you loved? Absolutely. And, and, and that's where the church should be. We can disagree and still love each other. And, and, that's, and that's, why, that's why we as a church will continue to preach the truth. You know, the Bible says Jesus came in grace and in truth. He came with incredible grace, but he always spoke the truth. He spoke the truth, but he did it in grace. And we're going to be a church that walks in grace and in truth. So we're never going to change what the Bible says, and we're going to call sexuality within God's boundaries the design that God has for us. But people are on the, their journey. I was on a journey with giving. When I first became a Christian, I was living outside of God's will in how, in how I treated my resources. I was still loved in the church. I was still embraced in the church, and they gave me a chance to walk down that road. And I have seen people at Shoreline Church walk away from living outside of God's will with their sexuality to walk into living outside of God's will in all kinds of ways as well. And that only happens when we walk together and love each other and have these conversations. Also, we are wise and find freedom when we follow God's plan and express our sexuality in ways that honor him. We are wisest and we find the greatest freedom. The greatest freedom is to live in the way that God's designed even when it doesn't make sense to us. And even if at the time it feels like captivity. Again, God's people were in captivity for 70 years. During that time, God says, I know the plans I have for you. I have plans to prosper you. I have plans for hope. I have plans for a future. But, but they were on a journey. And they were in a tough place. And so it's not always easy to walk in the way that God calls us to walk. But it's always the best way. It leads to the greatest freedom. And it honors God the most. I want to shift gears for just a moment. And I want to talk to married couples. As, as, as a man and a woman who've, who've stood before God and your family and friends and you've established a covenant relationship, I want to encourage you to grow in that marriage relationship and specifically in your intimacy, in your romance and your intimacy. So here's some challenges for married couples or those of you that plan on getting married and want to honor God in your marriage. Here's some ideas for married people. Number one, nurture your romantic and sexual relationship. Take it seriously. Make it wonderful and beautiful. God is not embarrassed by intimacy. You shouldn't be either. If you're married, God says, that's what I had in mind. So work at making it better. And there's seasons. When, we, when Sherry and I, when our boys were like one, three, and five years old, it was a challenging season. And romance was you know, expressed in a little different way. It's like when you could, anyways, it's challenging. <laughs> and, and if you're in your 80s or 90s, you know, it, may get, it, it may change. But nurturing romance and, and tending to that, tending the fires of that intimacy is important. That's why I encourage you to sign up for the, the, cher the Cherish Weekend coming up with Gary Thomas. It'll help you grow in that cherishing, loving intimacy. Next, recognize and name temptations and have accountability. What is it that tempts you? What is it that gets your eyes or your mind or your heart wandering or your body wandering? Recognize your temptations and have people who will keep you accountable, who pray for you, close friends. I've got men in my life that pray for me to be faithful to my wife. With all the stuff that you hear about these news reports of pastors and stuff, I've never said I could never fall into any sin. I, I, like I, said, I could fall into any sin. I don't say I would never fall into I say I could fall into any sin. So I'm on my guard. Live on your guard. Recognize the temptations that come your way. And if you're putting things in your heart and your mind that shouldn't be there, change that. Then set clear boundaries. Set absolute clear boundaries. There's things I won't do. I set a boundary about 37 years ago before I married my wife. You would never see me out in public at a restaurant, at a movie, doing something. You'd never see me out with another woman unless it's my wife or one of my three sisters. Ever. I'm so glad I made that decision. We just, we just celebrated, last week we celebrated 35 years of faithfulness, of love, of joy, of being married. Praise God for that. And, and here's the thing. Well, no, but we could have not made it there on a lot of occasions. But I have boundaries about, about what I won't do, what I will do. I was talking with a friend one day, and he goes, he's, 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 you like going to the movies? I said, I like a good movie. And he goes, well, my wife does too. He said, I don't like the movies. Would you ever take my wife to a movie? I said, you want me to date your wife? He says, no, I just want you to take her to a movie. I said, that's a date. He goes, oh my gosh, you're right. He says, he says, no, you shouldn't do that. I said, I would never do that. You know, I'm not going to go out to a movie with your wife. But, but, but I've got boundaries. It's an easy no because I know what my boundaries are. And so what are those boundaries? And set those for yourself. And then shine the light. When you see something creeping up, if you're a married person and you start finding yourself significantly attracted to someone besides your spouse, first pray about it. Second, tell close friends, same-sex friends. It'll keep you accountable. And then third, if you need to, talk to your spouse and tell them. So I'd never tell my wife or husband that I'm attracted to somebody else. And I'm not talking about like if you just go, oh, you know, he's handsome, oh, she's, she's pretty. Not that. But you find yourself thinking about the person, pondering the person, wondering when they're going to come by so you can see them, getting dressed in the morning, thinking, what will they think about how I look? I mean, your mind and heart are going towards that person. 
uh, Sherry and I agreed before we got married, if we ever felt that happening, we would tell each other. And in both of our, both cases, both Sherry and I, we've had points, in our, one time each, where we started, it didn't go, go beyond just in our mind and our heart, but noticing someone feeling something growing that wasn't appropriate, and we both told the other person. And, and it, it was difficult and painful, but you know what? When you put that in the light, it dies. When you leave it in the darkness, it grows. And, and so commit yourself to shine the light on, uh, on when you see temptation coming your way. And then guard your eyes and guard your heart. Guard your eyes, guard your heart. Can I, can I give you the strongest encouragement? Be careful what you look at. I mean, there's the hardcore bad stuff that nobody should be looking at. And if you're dealing with that, you know, get, get help, get accountability, deal with that. But, but there's so much stuff now that would have been called pornography 25 years ago that's just shows that we binge watch. And the level of nudity, the level of sexuality, the level of behavior that's not in line with God's will, if we watch it enough, it starts to soften our view of, of the biblical. And we just start, well, that's normal. That's normative. And maybe it'd be even normal for me. And I want to challenge you to really think about what you view and what you put in your, in your eyes goes to your mind, goes to your heart. And I think the reason Jesus was so serious about this is that when it's through our eyes and filling our mind and filling our heart, eventually it can become our actions. And it can because we just go, that's, that's what people do. That's just normal. But what should be normal for us is what God says is normal, what God says is good. And one last thought. This is a complex and powerful topic. Let's not let it divide us. I don't think it has to divide us. People will say, if you disagree, you hate me. If you disagree, we can't be friends. That's just not true. You know, I've raised three sons. I've disagreed with them and always loved them. My wife and I disagree on a regular basis, and I love her, and she loves me. We can disagree and still love each other. Let's not believe that lie. And I want to encourage you after the service, if you, have, if you want prayer for you or someone you love and care about, just come forward for prayer and let someone lift this up and let somebody pray for this. I wanna challenge you also, if you wanna go into great, greater depth, this book right here, Adam Barr, who preached here last Sunday, wrote this book, Compassion Without Compromise, one of the best, kind of simple, easy reading books on this topic. And I would encourage you to pick up a copy at, the, at our bookstore here. And then also The Ten Commandments by Kevin DeYoung, we also have copies of that. His chapter on adultery goes through a lot of the same themes and topics. And I wanna challenge you, uh, if you have... Preschool age kids, elementary, middle school, or high school kids, we have parental conversation guides for sexual integrity that are available for free in the Connection Center. Go by and pick one of those up and have those conversations. This isn't something that's going away. This isn't, you know, God, God made sexuality good. We're men and women. We're made of sexual beings. That's a good thing. It's not going away. But let's hold to the goodness of it. And let's ask God to speak to our hearts. As you go from this place, we all go into a world that is radically sexualized, where things that the Bible doesn't say are right are kind of the norm, will you walk in grace? Will you love people in any place of brokenness or wandering? Will you seek the heart of God? And will you seek to live in a way that honors him in every part of your life, even you being a man or a woman? And if you're married, If you're married, honor God in your marriage. Work at your marriage. If you need counseling, get counseling. If you want to talk with a pastor, talk with a pastor. If you need to read a good book or go to a good Christian conference on marriage, go to that. But make your marriage a priority, including your romance and your intimacy. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.